American History TV continues now with our Lectures in History series, which takes you inside American college classrooms. Next, a discussion on Abraham Lincoln's relationship with Native Americans. During his administration, the Dakota Wars in Minnesota took place, which resulted in 38 executions, as well as the 1864 Sand Creek Massacre. This is 50 Minutes. So, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, today's lecture is going to be on Abraham Lincoln. Um, and many of you probably don't think about Abraham Lincoln in context of American Indian or indigenous history. Um, but that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, you know, after all, Abraham Lincoln had a lot on his plate uh, when he was president, the Civil War. Uh, and that dominated most of his attention. But underneath the surface of the Civil War, I lay some important events involving American Indians, events that might, one might argue make Abraham Lincoln a bit more of a problematic figure uh, than he ordinarily is. So let's consider some major events in U.S. Indian affairs that happened during his presidency. It was during his presidency that the so-called Great Sioux Uprising, or what we might call the Dakota War of 1862, occurred. A conflict in which the state of Minnesota was drenched in blood as impoverished and hungry Dakota waged war on settlers and then faced the wrath of whites, who hunted down suspected culprits, tried, convicted, and sentenced to death 303 men. Lincoln commuted the sentence of most of these individuals, but in the end, 38 were hung in what remains America's largest mass execution. It was during the Lincoln presidency that the Navajo, or Diné, as they call themselves, were made to endure the long walk, a forced journey of hundreds of miles from their homeland to a wretched and barren reservation in eastern New Mexico. To commence the Navajo on their long walk, American soldiers burned crops, destroyed livestock, and sacked the Diné's homes. In their new reservations, Diné suffered immensely from the lack of food, diseases, and raids by other Indians. It was during the Lincoln presidency <clears throat> that one of the most atrocious episodes in U.S. Indian affairs occurred, and that was the massacre of Cheyennes at Sand Creek in eastern Colorado. On November 29, 1864, Colorado volunteers burst upon a Cheyenne village killing over 270 natives, over two-thirds of them being women and children. Some terrible events indeed. Should we today adhere to a buck stops here interpretation about Lincoln, that he has responsibility for this, these terrible events in American Indian history? Or should perhaps we give him a pass? You know, after all, Lincoln had a lot on this plate. He's fighting the Civil War, had the task of defeating the Confederacy, and perhaps some of these events out west were out of his control. How can these events then reflect negatively on his stature? So let's wrestle with some of these questions in this class today. So growing up in the early 19th century, Abraham Lincoln must have formed impressions of American Indians. He lived in Indiana and Illinois shortly after Tecumseh's defeat and during a time in which numerous indigenous peoples were facing increased pressure to give up their lands and move to the West. This happened during Lincoln's transformative years. Lincoln could not have been ignorant of these troubles and indeed when uh, Troubles erupted with the Sac and Fox, led by Black Hawk. Lincoln eagerly volunteered for military service, was in fact elected captain of a militia unit. Now, Lincoln uh, served in the military. He did not see much military action. Uh, he later recalled about his military career. It gave me more pleasure than I had ever had since, but... I had a good many bloody struggles with the mosquitoes, but did not see a live fighting Indian. 
Now, this was unlike Lincoln's grandfather and namesake who suffered death from Indian attack after moving from Virginia and Kentucky, from Virginia to Kentucky in the early 1780s. Lincoln only mentioned this family history in, in passing, and it does not appear that his willingness to engage in combat with the Sac and Fox occurred due to a desire for revenge. No, Lincoln's seems to have been driven by something more useful to him, a desire for prestige. And indeed, after the Black Hawk War, he would use his prestige in the military to run for elected office for the state legislature in Illinois. He lost. But of course, he would be involved in many other elections. Some he won and some he lost. And of course, the ultimate, he won the presidency. He was a Whig, member of the Whig Party. He was a member of the Whig Party, of course, during the Indian removals of the 1830s and 1840s. But he seemed to say very little about Indian removal. The one thing he did say was uh, a criticism of the Democrats for being inefficient, for spending too much money on removals of groups like the Cherokees and wars against the Seminoles. And he praised Winfield Scott, the military commander who oversaw Cherokee removal that we've learned about already. He said of Winfield Scott, in coming to Winfield Scott's uh, defense, uh, Winfield Scott was actually a Whig, uh, but he was ordered to oversee Cherokee removal uh, by President Martin Van Buren, a Democrat, uh, and he came under scrutiny for his operations, for being too lenient about the Cherokees, as I mentioned in class before, and he got criticized by the Democrats. But the Whigs countered, and Abraham Lincoln said of Winfield Scott that he was a noble-hearted man and Christian gentleman who did basically a good job and was no fool. There's very little in the documentary record uh, to believe that Abraham Lincoln deviated much from widespread assumptions about American Indians and U.S. Indian removal policies, policies of concentrating them on reservations and insisting on their cultural transformation. Uh, jumping ahead when he's president, for example, he once told a visiting delegation of Plains Indians, this delegation here that visited in March of 1863, Pay attention to that date, March of 1863. He said to these native visitors, The pale faced people are numerous and prosperous because they cultivate the earth, produce bread, and depend upon the products of the earth rather than wild game for a subsistence. This is the chief reason of the difference. But there is another. Although we are now engaged in a great war between one another, we are not, as a race, so much disposed to fight and kill one another as our red brethren. I can only say that I can see no way in which your race is to become numerous and prosperous as the white race except by living as they do by the cultivation of the earth. Now, of course, this is in March of 1863. What's very ironic about the way he characterizes indigenous peoples? Anybody? Joseph? Um, we were right on the cusp of the Civil War and the expansion of slavery. West already had numerous violent outbursts between white men. Right. So this is during the Civil War. What's happening in the Civil War? Tens of thousands of Americans are dying in these horrendous battles. And he is saying that Indians are inherently warlike, unlike Euro-Americans. So left unsaid in Abraham Lincoln's word, of course, is this idea that Western development must proceed. Lincoln was a proponent of manifest destiny, the great engines of destruction that bore down on native peoples, railroads and mines. He was all in favor of building railroads into the West, all in favor of bringing Western resources into Eastern markets, including the gold and silver of Western mines that led to things like the genocide of California Indians. And, of course, he was all in favor of white people being able to expand into the West and settle and carve up the land into farms. And in that degree, he agreed with Southerners that Western development should continue. 
But where he disagreed with Southerners, of course, is on the expansion of slavery. Lincoln, of course, believed, as many Northerners did, that slavery should not be allowed to expand in the West, that slavery would be unfair competition from ordinary whites being able to make a living on the Western land. Whereas Southerners, of course, as we've talked about before, believed ardently in the expansion of slavery, believing if slavery did not expand, it would die, and their way of life would end. So Southerners and Northerners were part of this settler colonialist mentality that dominated America at the time, that Western land should become available, indigenous people should be eliminated, and that land should be developed by whites, in the case of Northerners, with free labor, or in the case of Southerners, whites who owned African-American slaves employing slave labor. That is the root of the Civil War. Who should get control of the Western land? The slave owners or humble white folk? And indeed, much of the events that we're going to talk about here are very much part of the Civil War then. If the Civil War was about either furthering the expansion of slavery or stopping the expansion of slavery, onto whose land? Indigenous peoples. And so these events are very much part of this larger American story of the Civil War. So the first episode that I want to talk about that Lincoln played a direct role in is the Dakota War of 1862. Now, as I've talked about before, uh, the Dakota uh, War belonged to this larger group of people that outsiders called the Sioux. Um, and, but the Sioux called themselves either Dakota, Lakota, or Nakota, depending on the dialect, which means the people. Many of the so-called Sioux did move out onto the Western Plains and adopt the horse and become um, full-time uh, 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 buffalo hunters living in teepees and uh, searching the buffalo in the West. But a group of so-called Sioux remained in Minnesota. They called themselves the Dakota. And they traded first with the French, then the British, and the Americans. And as we've talked about in this class, when these trade relations are going on, when indigenous peoples are, are giving items, beaver pelts, buffalo hides, deer skins, to uh, these newcomers, and the newcomers are giving them manufactured goods, that's not just about an economic transaction. What is that about? What is being built? Jesse? Kinship. Jesse said kinship. So the Dakota believed that they had kinship relations with these newcomers. But by the 1840s, these kinship relations began to break down. By the 1840s, the Dakotas are lacking in uh, wild game uh, to trade with traders. They're falling into debt. And, of course, this was all to the joy of U.S. policymakers because part of U.S. policy, which we've talked about, was to purposely force indigenous peoples into debt so that they would have nothing left to sell, but everyone can say this, what? Land. land. Absolutely, their land. And so the Dakota signed a few treaties, including a treaty in 1851 that gave up a large chunk of what is today the state of Minnesota, leaving them a small sliver of land along the Minnesota River. Now, these treaties, of course, were, as many of the treaties were, uh, rife with problems. The Dakota would be paid in annuities, yearly payments, but these annuities often would never reach the Dakotas. They would go straight into the pockets of traders who claimed the Dakota owed them for past debts. One Episcopal bishop that became aware of these problems and this fraud going on declared that a nation that sowed robbery would reap a harvest of blood. 
And of course, he could not be any more correct. Tensions got very intense in the summer of 1862. In the summer of 1862, the Dakotas, who had made uh, some changes, who adapted to Euro-American ways, some including going to church, uh, becoming farmers, uh, more full-time farmers instead of hunting, gathering, and farming, wearing Euro-American clothes, and learning to speak English. But others had not, of course. But as I mentioned, by the summer of 1862, circumstances had grown very tense. They had grown very tense because many Dakotas were very hungry. Crops had not uh, uh, been as abundant as they had. The lack of land meant they lost access to traditional resources that would make up in times of dearth. And they depended on those annuities. They depended on those annuities to buy food. But the federal government had not sent money to Minnesota to pay the Dakotas, money that they could have used to buy food. There was food. There was plenty of food. And it was stored in a warehouse near the agency. When the Dakota approached the agent and asked for food so they could feed themselves. They were denied. They did not have the money. And one trader declared to the Dakotas, who didn't have the money to pay for the food, declared to them, let them eat grass. Well, many Dakotas had had enough. Had enough. One of those individuals was the leader, Little Crow. Little Crow had accommodated Euro-American and U.S. civilization policy to a degree. He believed that the Dakotas must change in order to survive on their land in Minnesota, on their much-reduced land. But he had trouble. He had trouble becoming a farmer, becoming a Christian, and so he did not fully buy into the civilization program. He was looked upon as a brave leader, And he was approached by young warriors who had had enough. And they appealed to his valor that they must attack to drive the settlers out of their traditional hunting grounds. And Little Crow reluctantly agreed. He agreed to leave, leave the Dakotas in war against the settlers. And indeed, the Dakota warriors attacked Minnesota settlers, killed hundreds captured many others, and put Minnesotans in a state of panic. The Minnesota militia, of course, came in and counterattacked. The Minnesota militia led by Colonel Henry Sibley. He reached the Dakota Reservation and undertook the pursuit of Little Crow. Through the month of September, Sibley's forces chased the Dakota northward. The Dakota could not mount much of a counterattack. Now, it was mostly warriors from Little Crow's band who waged the war. The majority of Dakota did not want to have anything to do with this conflict and tried to remain peaceful, even surrendering to Sibley's forces. So in the end, Little Crow never had the unity that the Minnesotans believed he did, and he had few options but to take what few followers remained of his and flee for the Great Plains. Friendly natives and most of the captives remained behind, as did a number of those who participated in the war but refused to go into the barren plains. Sibley's forces surrounded these encampments. By October 3rd, 1862, Sibley had 1,200 Dakotas under his control. Men were disarmed and tried by a military commission. Warriors who simply admitted to being at one of the battles were determined guilty and given the death sentence. By November 4th, 303 Dakota men were sentenced to die. Think about it. 303 men were sentenced to die in one execution. Now, unlike military affairs in in other places, Lincoln played a more direct role in events in Minnesota. Minnesota. 
he ordered General John Pope to take command in the Minnesota War. Pope indeed proved willing to prosecute the war with brutal rigor. When he arrived in Minnesota, he informed Sibley, it is my purpose utterly to exterminate the Sioux if I have the power to do so, and even if it requires a campaign lasting the whole of next year. They are to be treated as maniacs or wild beasts, and by no means as people with whom treaties or compromises can be made. Harsh words, indeed. Under Pope's orders, Sibley, who had been elevated to the rank of Brigadier General, proved quite successful at bringing the Dakota into submission. Later, Pope expressed enthusiasm for the mass execution of those 303 sentenced to die. Abraham Lincoln thought otherwise. Upon receiving news of the upcoming executions, Lincoln requested the transcripts of the trials. He and his lawyers looked through these transcripts, and he found that many of these men were sentenced on the flimsiest of evidence. And he pardoned or, or dismissed uh, the executions of all but 39. But still, 39 were slated to die. The execution date was set for December 6. One more was pardoned, and 38 were hung, marking the largest max es- mass execution in U.S. history. Now, this marker, of course, is no longer there in Minnesota to mark this event. You listen to a podcast, um, which you can't see this, and folks at home, you can't see this, but it says, uh, The Little War on the Prairie. And it's an NPR, it's an a American Life podcast. Uh, now it's a podcast. It was a broadcast on November 23rd, 2012. Can someone tell me? Or, or, or think about, why did Minnesotans forget about this? Why did Minnesotans, and it's one of the, the shocking things for the, the people involved in this, they didn't even know this happened. Why? Why? Edwin. I think it was very controversial at the time. They kind of just opted out of their history. Okay. Opted out of their history. Anybody else? Logan? Um, towards the end of the, um, the audio, it mentions that um, it made people, what happened there kind of made people scared of a bunch of the frontier. And they kind of tried to omit it from what they told the rest of the nation to try and get and encourage people to come on um, Colin. Okay. Uh, Logan makes a very good point that one, Minnesota's still filling with settlers. The officials want people to come. You don't advertise a, an Indian war to get people to come into this territory, right? Joseph? The recent uh, history of the time would view this as a relatively um, heroic act, given that they were seen as an enemy. Okay. So it was, it was a, a mode to preserve the manifest destiny reasoning of the time period. Okay. So if it was talked about at all, it was talked about as a justified war. But as time changes, and this war doesn't seem, it seems much more complicated, people, instead of embracing the complexity, thinking about the complexity, they simply chose to ignore it. Very good. <clears throat> well, what about Lincoln? So Lincoln, following the mass execution, was still under great pressure from the Minnesota congressional delegation and voters in Minnesota. Um, who There's an election coming up in 1864. And he already angered the Minnesotans. The Minnesotans wanted all of those 303 men to die. And Lincoln reduced the number down. But Lincoln did capitulate to the Minnesotans by forcing even the friendly Dakotas to be moved into the Western Plains. The Dakotas were forced on their own trail of tears following the Dakota War out into the West. And not only the Dakotas, but also a group of people that had nothing to do with the war, the Ho-Chunks, who lived in this um, southeastern corner of Minnesota. Minnesotans wanted them gone as well. And as Abraham Lincoln 
and seeing forward the Emancipation Proclamation. He, is, he also signed the Winneba- Winnebago Removal Bill. The Americans called the Ho-Chunks the Winnebagos. This removal bill passed in February of 1863, stipulating that in June of 1863, the, the Ho-Chunks would be removed. And indeed they were in a grueling process in which many died on their way or died after ri- arriving in their desolate determination. Destination, sorry. Perhaps it could be said that Lincoln was to the Ho-Chunk as Jackson was to the Cherokees. So what of Little Crow? Little Crow traveled about on the plains seeking allies, but largely failed. Uh, At one point, tired and hungry, he does come back into Minnesota, and he's picking berries in a farmer's field. Uh, And the farmer's son sees uh, this man, didn't know who he was, just knew he was a native person, and shot him, killed him. Later, um, the farmer and the neighbors realize that this was the infamous Little Crow. His body was mutilated, and his remains would be put in the Minnesota Historical Society, where they would remain until 1971, when they were returned to a descendant. Here is a uh, George Catlin painting of of the Ho Chunk, and as I mentioned before, the Ho Chunk, Lincoln is like Jackson is to the Cherokees. Another group that were forcefully removed from the homeland during Lincoln's administration were the Diné, or Navajo. At the outset of the Civil War, uh, the Diné were composed of many loosely allied bands. Uh, Some of these bands uh, were quite wealthy in terms of livestock. They raised sheep, they farmed, they grew corn. Uh, and other bands uh, did a considerable amount of raiding. Raiding was part of their economy. It had been part of their economy for generations. They raided the Pueblos uh, and New Mexicans, uh, raided livestock, raided for food. Uh, They raided into Mexico as well. When the United States uh, conquered and took half of Mexico, uh, into what is today the state of New Mexico and Arizona, now the United States inherits this, um, what they saw as a problem of raiding. And they step up their actions to police indigenous peoples in the area during the Civil War, particularly as uh, the Union depended on communication with California, a northern state, a, a Union state, and particularly uh, as, as gold was sent from California to the east to fund the Civil War effort. Well, Indian raids was the last thing the Union Army wanted. And so they sent in American soldiers to stop these raids. Here is the, uh, the Navajo uh, Nation's homeland in the Four Corners region of the southwestern United States. Kit Carson was sent in to do something about the Navajo raids. And what he did was he ordered that the Navajo must go to eastern New Mexico to a place called Bosque Redondo, hundreds of miles away. If they did not go, they would be forced to go. Well, many of the Navajos did not want to go. So Carson, in 1863 and 1864, sent in troops to round up the Navajo. And he pursued scorched earth tactics, destroying what could be consumed so that the Diné would be starved into submission, something, of course, he says very clearly in his own words. Indeed, Diné surrendered nearly nearly 8,000 the best we can tell. The numbers may vary. 8,000 Diné were forced to march from their homeland to Bosque Redondo, an event they called the Long Walk. And on the Long Walk, of course, 
Navajos died from exposure, diseases, and other things. Now, you were to have read this letter, and I'm sure you all read it, and as I was told earlier, that you guys in school didn't even learn cursive writing. So that's unfortunate for, for, for us that want you guys to become history majors and do historical research, because part of historical research, of course, is looking at, as I tell my kids, old stuff. <laughs> I like looking at old stuff. I like reading this stuff. And once you get a hang of it, you, you can, you, once you understand someone's writing, you can really understand it. I actually think this is pretty clear compared to some of the other stuff I read. Um, so I ask you to, to read this and, and give me your general impression of the attitude of George Pettis, who was a military officer who oversaw a contingent of Diné on the Long Walk. And so what, how would you characterize his attitude? Edwin? Yeah, yeah kind of had more of a sympathetic attitude towards the, uh, the Navajo, Navajo, sorry, Navajo. Okay. But he, it kind of implied he did not really like what they were doing too much because they were making them go to a land that he knew they had no shot to survive on. Okay. Well, you know, I suppose some of these things can be read differently. Um, what, anybody else? Uh, Franklin? Wait, wait, wait for the mic. How's your time to be a star? <laughs> yep. um, once uh, Pettis arrived with those Navajos at uh, Fort Sumter or the uh, Navajo, Navajo, um, Bas Redondo, Bas Redondo um, the, he began to have sympathy because he was writing in another part of the letter to his wife, this is a terrible place. Um, and there's algae, and it's it, there's un, the water is unsanitary. So once he saw indigenous peoples beginning to get become ill there, I think he started to display some sympathy. Could be, and that wouldn't be uncommon that some of these military officers have to do this duty. They don't particularly like to do this duty. They would much rather be if maybe dying at the time in Gettysburg or something. I don't know, um, but uh, I don't know. I picked up something different. Did anybody pick up more of a joy here in the back? Away from the mic. Uh, raise your hand, Joy. There you go. I got more of a vibe of indifference that he was more complaining about the journey than anything else. Like I, when he was walking over the mountains, I cursed these three times. It's such a long walk. He didn't really seem to care about the people he was leading. Just he was more to me whining about the journey. Okay. Yeah. So. He does, he does give us evidence that his journey was a hardship, there was lack of food, people suffered, but he also complaining that he himself suffered as well. So that indifference, I think, comes out as well. What jumped out to me, actually, is this quote right here. And in this, of course, he uses the pejorative term that I'll project up here. Um, that, you know, four Indians died and were buried on the road, so I got here with 239 of the Redskins they causing me very little trouble other than feeding such a large number for every day. So it's kind of, woe is me, I have to, you know, had some die and now I have to feed them. Um, to me, you would have to read this in context of his other letters to get his attitude and context of other letters that do exist. But to me, this kind of encapsulates at best indifference, but also a disdain also a disdain for the people he was charged with, not even seeing them as peoples, but seeing them and using the pejorative term here, which also will give you indication why that is a pejorative term for many indigenous peoples, that it dehumanizes real human beings. And so you see it in these letters as groups like the Diné are being forced onto their barren reservation. So they're forced into Bosque Redondo. And at Bosque Redondo, they come under the uh, control of a military man. Who, who, who believes, he, he's a firm believer, Carlton is his name. Who believes that in the civilization program, who believes that indigenous people should become like your Americans. And he takes it kind of as his task, kind of this missionary zeal that he will transform the Navajos into this prosperous, delightful Pueblo of Indians in all of New Mexico. 
But, of course, he could not be any more wrong. Eastern New Mexico. Anybody been in eastern New Mexico? It's, no one's been in eastern New Mexico. If you drive through eastern New Mexico, there's not a lot there, folks. If anybody from New Mexico uh, watches this uh, on TV, I love New Mexico, by the way. Uh, I got pulled over there once. Uh, but uh, it is beautiful country, but it's not good farmland. It's not good farmland. And Bos Redondo was a barren, desolate place that when the Diné reached their location, they suffered from lack of food, malnutrition, diseases, exposure, raids by nearby groups, Comanches and Kiowas, and many more died. It was truly a horrible experience. It was so horrible that the United States government actually admitted that it was a mistake. And in 1868, they negotiate another treaty with the Navajo in which they are allowed to go back to their homeland to where their contemporary reservation is today, back to the Four Corners region. I had you guys listen to a brief NPR newscast on the opening of uh, Bosque Redondo. Uh, uh, I forget what it's called. It's a kind of interpretive center to um, memorialize those who suffered on the Long Walk. Uh, and the Long Walk, of course, becomes very prominent in Navajo oral history as something that unites them, a horrible memory, but one in which uh, 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 they see themselves as all of one people that uh, have to join together to survive. And they've commemorated this through the years, including carrying rocks from their, from their reservation to Bosque Redondo and, of course, opening this uh, uh, new center. Now, uh, the NPR newscast, the Navajo's own Trail of Tears, in that newscast, you heard the voices of contemporary Diné, and their views of what their history was. And what were some of the takeaways that you had from that newscast? Anybody want to volunteer an answer? Franklin? Um, the um, modern-day uh, Navajos, they in the uh, podcast, what they really were, I think, emphasizing is they want the, mo- the memorial to serve as a way that um, their story, their ancestors' story, can always be remembered by future generations. That was, I think, their most important view. Okay. Good. It's a way, you know, to bring their stories from the oral history to, 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 to the public, um, so that it would be remembered and not forgotten. I have one more up here. Joseph. Um, I also found that many of the contemporary uh, indigenous people were looking for acknowledgement mm-hmm. from those who aren't part of this community that such a thing did take place and that it happened in such a term. Okay. Part of, that's true. Um, part of this is you know, not just telling... Um, stories to each other, but to the larger world, so that we don't forget this, so we know this history as well. I was taken with um, uh, um, the, 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 the Diné woman who came in and, and, and her, uh, her prayer to her ancestors, her, her song, but also that it's about triumph as well, of uh, people overcoming their, these horrible ordeals and being here today, being survivors, and telling the story of survivors, survival. When many p- places, um, such as where we live today, Long Island, where most people don't know the indigenous history of this island, uh, it's important that we know the, that history. But not only that we know, not only that we know that history, but we know that indigenous peoples still are here today. And of course, did anybody recall? How many people are belong to the Navajo Nation today? Then give me a ballpark figure. It's on the podcast. Joy. Uh, 300, yeah, over three hundred thousand. Over three hundred thousand. So there's a large nation of people that are still here today that have uh, went through this tor- horrible ordeal. As did the Mescalero Apaches. Uh, some of them who were removed with Kit Carson's raids. So the 
The last episode here that I'll talk about is one that is perhaps leaves the worst taste in someone's mouth about U.S. Indian policy, and that are, is the uh, Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado in 1864. <clears throat> so this massacre involved the Colorado militia and Cheyennes and Arapahoes. Cheyennes and Arapahoes were people that often, uh, you know, they were, uh, uh, they were they hunted the buffalo in bands uh, that ranged from uh, the northern Rockies down into Colorado on the front range of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and they often hunted together and lived together, the Cheyenne and Arapahoes, um, we often talk about them in the same same <coughs> group, even though they're distinctive people. With the mining strikes in the Colorado mountains, the Rocky Mountains in the 1850s, there was great pressure on the western Indian tribes to live on smaller reservations, smaller reservations that in which they would, they would be confined there to not interfere with overland travel. And the Cheyenne Arapaho supposedly agreed to a reservation under the Fort Wise tr Treaty of 1861, a treaty that reduced Cheyenne Arapaho land to a small chunk of land uh, in eastern Colorado. But this treaty was problematic, as most treaties are, that not all Cheyenne and Arapaho bands signed this treaty, acknowledged it as, as valid. And those that did sign it, did they actually know what it meant? Well, these treaties are all problematic. And so the Cheyenne Arapaho, many of them did not agree to live on the reservation. And of course, this angered Coloradans, Coloradans who wanted the Cheyenne and Arapaho confined. Coloradans by 1864 had grown very fearful of indigenous peoples, particularly because of news reports from Minnesota and reports were circulating that the Western Indian tribes were planning what they said, an uprising. One of those who paid attention to these rumors was the military commander of Colorado's volunteer forces, the Methodist, former Methodist minister, Colonel John Shivington. And he's also known as the Fighting Parsons because he had been a Methodist minister, uh, and the word Parsons, of course, for Methodist minister. In the spring of 1864, when the grasses started sprouting, various Cheyenne and Arapaho bands began to break up their winter encampments, spreading out to go hunting. This, of course, put fear into whites who believed that this uprising was going to take place. Shivington soldiers were given orders to, quote, burn villages and kill Cheyennes whenever and wherever found. One band of Cheyennes led by Black Kettle, a pro-American chief, were the first to encounter the Colorado Volunteers. And what was a prelude to the Sand Creek Massacre, two Cheyennes rode up to Shivington's troops with papers bearing the marks of Abraham Lincoln, telling of Black Kettle's friendly character. The bands were led by the Cheyenne leader, Black Kettle. The two men were shot dead in cold blood. Shivington's forces then opened fire on the rest of the Cheyennes with howitzers. The Indians returned fire, but quit after Black Kettle ordered them to stop. The soldiers retreated, leaving 28 natives dead. President Lincoln and his subordinates, wrapped up in Grant's battles with Lee in Virginia and the coming election of 1864, paid no attention to affairs on the plains and left it up to General Samuel Curtis to communicate with the governor of Colorado and the Colorado Volunteers about how to handle the situation. On September 28, 1864, Curtis informed Colonel Shivington, I want no peace until the Indians suffer more. Nevertheless, Black Kettle wanted peace, and in November, he and some of his leading men rode into Fort Lyon. Uh, Fort Wise was renamed during the Civil War to Fort Lyon. I believe it was named after a Virginia governor and Colorado being a pro-Union state, uh, renamed it Fort Lyon. So Black Kettle uh, sent, uh, went into uh, Fort Lyon 
asking for peace. But the commanders of Fort Lyon told him that they did not have the authority to accept his surrender, nor could they give the Cheyennes food. Meanwhile, the Colorado papers were calling for extermination and chastised Chivington as a coward. He had the opportunity earlier, and he did not take it. So on November 29, 1864, Shivington deployed 700 Colorado volunteers to attack the Cheyennes. After seeing the approaching army, Black Kettle hoisted an American flag and a white flag and sent a messenger, White Antelope, to greet the army. White Antelope was shot dead in a volley that the soldiers launched into the village. The cavalry continued their charge into the village and for several hours butchered men, women, and children. Cheyenne bodies were mutilated. Even infants were scalped by Coloradans. Immediately after the massacre, the Colorado press celebrated. Colorado soldiers have again covered themselves with glory. Uh, Some of the Cheyenne scalps were taken back to Denver and they were paraded in a theater and the theater patrons, seeing the Cheyenne scalps, stood and applaud, applauded. Lincoln, unfortunately, remains mute on the Sand Creek Massacre. Did the cries for extermination emanating from Colorado trouble him? Perhaps not, if his commissioner of Indian Affairs echoed his views. After the successful re-election campaign of 1864, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs wrote his annual report and praised the energetic action of Governor Evans. Once the true reality of Sand Creek came to light, however, members of Lincoln's party publicly condemned the atrocious event and called for reform of Indian policy. A congressional committee was authorized to investigate the sordid affair and ultimately concluded after Lincoln's death, that the Cheyenne were mutilated in the most horrible manner. Had Lincoln lived, perhaps he would have been among those in which Sand Creek Massacre had left a bad taste in their mouths and a more humane policy might have happened instead of militaristic campaigns for extermination. But of course, we will never know. His presidency gives us little clues what he would have actually done. Sand Creek, by any objective measure, was an unprovoked murder of Cheyennes and Arapahoes. For many years, um, Colorado celebrated this as a battle, a battle of the Civil War. But more recently, though, more recently, and thanks to the hard work and effort of descendant survivors, Cheyennes and Arapahoes, now we know this, and we should know this, as a massacre site and it has become a national historic site in eastern Colorado. So, what about Lincoln? What are we to make of him? He has left posterity with a troubling legacy. And I'll admit, when, if historians often get asked, you know, who is the best president? I perhaps would say Abraham Lincoln, because his determination to preserve the Union, and that he oversaw the end of slavery. But when we look at this through the lens of indigenous history, Lincoln is perhaps no different from any other president in the 19th century. And a, someone who was in favor of westward expansion and believed in manifest destiny. I perhaps it is hard to say that the buck should stop with him. He was very busy fighting the Civil War. There was a lot going on. But I suppose to those thousands of Dakotas who were forced from their homelands, along with the Ho-Chunks, the buck perhaps should stop with him. I suppose for those thousands of Diné who had to endure the long walk and the wretched conditions on Bosque Redondo, the buck should stop with him. And I suppose for those hundreds of Cheyenne and Arapaho who were murdered by Shivington's forces, Lincoln should come under more scrutiny. So thank you very much, and we'll see you on Friday.